Well, it turned out to be another record-setting day on Wall Street. The S&P 500 didn't go up a whole lot today, but it went up enough to have another closing all-time high. So uh, markets keep on humming right along through the end of April here as we approach May. And uh, some folks' feelings that perhaps seasonality will eventually catch up with this bull market. But uh, right now, it does seem like the path of least resistance continues to be to the upside. We had Apple report after the bell tonight, so we're going to take a look at that along with Amgen and AMD. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at a quiet improving sector and a trade application that comes from that area. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's April 30th, 2019. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. I'm grateful to have you in our audience tonight. Remember to go to YouTube, subscribe to our channel. While you're over there, go to the description area and check out our email distribution list link. That way you can be alerted whenever we post these videos. We can also give you the heads up on which stocks in the S&P 500 are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Zee. Also, I'll be in Omaha this upcoming weekend for uh, my 15th straight year for the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. So I always try to do a lot of tweeting from Omaha. So for those of you that want to stay kind of involved in that weekend and see what Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger have to say, uh, I would encourage you to follow me. Again, my handle is at Brandon Van Zee. Uh, in addition to Twitter, we also use Facebook. Feel free to join our group at the web address embedded in the link in front of you. All right, with that, let's go ahead and dive into the charts. As you can see, I've got chart 4B pulled up in front of us here. And as I mentioned in the intro, uh, we did have an, a record all-time closing high. Now notice that we didn't quite get to an intraday high that occurred yesterday, uh, but nonetheless, we did close higher on the S&P 500 by about three points today. So uh, that does uh, equate to a, a new all-time record closing high for the markets as we uh, head on into May here. The other uh, indices didn't quite have anything quite as exciting as that going on. Uh, in fact, you found lower markets for the NASDAQ. Now keep in mind, uh, Alphabet, the parent company of Google, uh, really struggled here today. Uh, we saw that uh, this morning on the 9 at 9 uh, there, for those of you that follow that. Uh, but uh, that was one of the worst performers of the day. Remember that uh, Alphabet's one of the most influential members of the NASDAQ composite. And so I think that kind of weighed down some of those tech stocks there. Uh, so the NASDAQ was actually down 0.81% today. Of course, we retain our bullish posture at this point. So, uh, you know, one day does not make a trend. So we'll have to keep uh, our eye on that situation. Remember, we did get an overbought cluster signal on that yesterday, but uh, remember that doesn't necessarily guarantee that the trend is going to end. It's just that uh, the trend is likely to slow down at that point. Uh, we also had a down day on the Russell 2000. Notice the Russell 2000 was down 0.45% today, and then the Dow was up uh, just barely up 0.15%. So um, pretty modest day, all things uh, considered especially uh, when you take into consideration the fact that we have all these earnings reports going on. And uh, as I mentioned here in the intro, we had a number of companies coming out after the bell tonight that could influence market trading starting tomorrow. So real quick here, let's go over to the trade tab, kind of show you some of those results. Amgen came out first. Uh, Amgen uh, is a company that uh, had been struggling here recently along with the rest of the healthcare sector. Uh, and it's about break even after hours. It had been uh, down a little bit lower initially after they reported the earnings and then the stock surged uh, for the five minutes after that and it was trading above where it closed. Uh, and now it's right back kind of in line with where it closed. Notice it closed at 179.32 uh, and uh, it's trading just a hair below 179 in the after hours session. So a bit of a non-event there uh, in terms of Amgen despite them uh, beating uh, Wall Street ex expectations in terms of earnings per share. Uh, AMD, the last I checked, uh, was up nicely. And I think uh, Wall Street breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief there, uh, as we did see Intel fall pretty dramatically last week on their earnings announcement. And so uh, good to see that their chief competitor, AMD, uh, did not uh, follow the same path. Uh, notice that AMD closed the normal session at 2763. Uh, it's currently trading up close to $29.20. So that's a pretty healthy move on a percentage basis after hours for AMD. And then last but certainly not least, the big kahuna, uh, Apple, or at least one of the big kahunas. I did see that Microsoft officially closed 
closed with a $1 trillion market cap for the first time ever today. So uh, Apple, of course, was uh, once one of the largest companies there, still is, uh, was once the the big kahuna themselves. But uh, they kind of go back and forth with, with Microsoft and Amazon, depending upon the day in terms of uh, who's the biggest market cap out there. Uh, but right now, uh, Apple shareholders are rejoicing after hours. Uh, you do see that uh, Apple's share price is up about $10 uh, per share. Notice that the closing price on Apple was $200.67. It's currently trading a hair above $210 right now. Um, some of you might have noticed uh, me tweeting about Apple and their expectations for dividend increases earlier today on Twitter. Um, and so they did come out. I did just check a moment ago and uh, they did raise their dividend, but that dividend increase was quite underwhelming, at least from my perspective. You'll notice that right here, it shows that they raised their dividend from 73 cents to 77 cents. That's only good for about a 5% increase uh, for a company like Apple uh, that is very cash rich and that only has a current yield of 1.46%. Uh, they could have afforded a much uh, juicier dividend increase. So that was a bit uh, of a letdown from uh, the dividend perspective, but clearly uh, traders of the stock right now don't really care about that dividend increase as much as they care about some of the uh, the economic numbers coming through in terms of profits and sales, etc. So that hopefully bodes well uh, and, and hopefully can offset a little bit of the negativity that the market had towards uh, Alphabet yesterday. Uh, Apple is trying to do what it can to kind of uh, salvage the, the tech world a little bit there. All right, let's get back on track with some of the uh, more general charts now. Uh, before moving on to our, our next series of charts, just a, a quick reminder that all of our charts here remain bullish. Remember the background colors on chart uh, 4B here will tell us whether we have a bullish or bearish posture according to the market forecast intermediate term posture. So right now we retain bullish postures across the board going into May. We'll see if that changes as uh, we go forward in May. Uh, there's always the, the battle cry of sell in May and go away, but of course uh, that does not work every single calendar year. So uh, it's something to be mindful of, but likely not something that you should uh, implement assuming uh, that it's anywhere close to a 100% guarantee each and every year because it most certainly is not. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our next chart setup now. This will be chart 4C. And this is our three green arrows chart setup. Now, when we look at this particular uh, chart, there is one uh, additional thing to report that uh, would not have been uh, occurring yesterday, and that is that uh, the NASDAQ composite no longer has three green arrows. Notice down below here in the lower left-hand corner, we did receive a red arrow on the MACD histogram. Uh, and so we are seeing a little bit of a loss in momentum there in the NASDAQ composite. Again, it's entirely possible that Apple you know, rallies the troops and sends the, the, the NASDAQ higher again tomorrow, and, and perhaps Perhaps that reverts back to a, a green arrow, but as of this moment in time, uh, the NASDAQ composite did react negatively enough to Alphabet's earnings uh, where we did see uh, a bit of a red arrow come into place there. So uh, as it stands right now, two of our charts do have the three green arrows set up, uh, and that is the S&P 500. As you can see, we got our green arrow back on the MACD here uh, late last week, and then we also uh, on the same day, got our, our green arrow back on the MACD on the Russell 2000. Of those two charts, uh, the S&P 500 appears to be the one that is a little bit more fit for trend trading. Remember, the Russell 2000 does have three green arrows, but as you look at the price action of the chart, it's more of a sideways trending index at this point, uh, whereas you actually have a little bit more of an ascent there coming out of the S&P 500. All right, let's take a look at our next chart setup now. This will be chart 4D, and this is our 1040 crossover method. Not gonna spend a lot of time on this other than to remind you that as of right now, we do have bullish crossovers across the board when you're looking at the 10-week and the 40-week moving averages on all four of our major US equity indices. Uh, the most recent crossover that, we, uh, that occurred was here with the Russell 2000, and that occurred at the beginning of April, and uh, basically, has uh, continued to be the case. Obviously, the markets have been reasonably strong uh, for the last month or so, so have no reason to expect that the crossover will go back to the negative side, uh, but we'll uh, continue to report upon that in case conditions do change going forward. So stay tuned here in these Market Outlook videos. All right, let's now uh, take a peek here at our chart 4E. 
This is our inner market analysis 12 grid. And as a reminder, when we look at these 12 grid setups here, the background color will tell us whether we have a bullish or a bearish posture on each of these charts according to the market forecast intermediate term line. All right, so as we kind of get started here, um, you know, we're kind of looking at you know, either trends or reversals of trends or just important price action that we might identify from a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one thing that I wanted to, uh, to point out was that the dollar did pull back today. You'll notice it was down 0.3% uh, today. However, the dollar, in my opinion, remains in a fairly significant uptrend. Now, I don't know how long that's gonna last. Um, nobody really knows that uh, for certain. Uh, you know, the, the future is unknowable, but what you try to do is, is shape your opinion uh, around what has happened in the in the recent past and and with the dollar you can see that it has done a very good job of carving out higher highs and higher lows along the way might not have been perfect this got a little dicey right here where this was more of an equal low as opposed to a higher low but nonetheless it did a good job recovering and as you can see the vast majority of time spent for the UUP has been above that 30-day moving average that you see on the chart there with the exception of that little hiccup there and that little hiccup back there so Right now we have a little bit of a pullback in the dollar. Uh, perhaps we, we make it all the way back around this uptrending 30-day uh, moving average before we catch another bid to the upside. Um, when the dollar is weak, sometimes we see commodities improve in price. We did see a little bit of an improvement out of uh, gold here today. It was up 0.29%. However, you look at that chart and it's not all that impressive at this point. Um, interestingly enough, egg commodities did not improve. Um, you know, one of the stocks we've been talking about in, in some of my uh, dividend-oriented classes uh, here at Market Scholars has been Archer Daniels Midland. For those of you that uh, maybe were uh, raised in the Midwest like I was, you're probably familiar with Archer Daniels Midland. For those, those of you that are city slickers, maybe not so much, but uh, they are uh, one of the largest grain processing companies on the planet. And typically when, um, when, when prices of crops go down, that is actually a benefit for a grain processing and crushing company like Archer Daniels. So keep an eye on that. I think uh, the ticker symbol for a, uh, Archer Daniels Midland is ADM. That is one of those dividend aristocrats. And you'll notice this thing has really taken off in the last couple of days. So um, sometimes you can take these themes that you're learning on these 12 grids from a macro perspective and then apply them from a micro perspective into some of the stock oriented names out there. One other thing to report, mentioned uh, I'll be in, in Omaha this weekend uh, to check out Buffett uh, and Munger and, and see what their thoughts are on the economy. Uh, there was some interesting news here today in regards to uh, us taking a look at the crude oil chart over here. Uh, there's been a bit of a tug of war going on recently between Occidental and Chevron for the right to buy out Anadarko Petroleum. Today was a very interesting day in that uh, news surfaced that uh, Occidental was teaming up with Warren Buffett and, and Berkshire Hathaway uh, to pr potentially provide uh, financing up to around 12 uh, $10 billion. And so uh, they kind of have Buffett in their corner now. So it's looking a little bit more like Occidental might actually pull off that coup. Originally, it was uh, stated that uh, Chevron was going to be the, the buyer of those assets. And so been interesting to watch that. Uh, remember that this has been um, kind of a strange year in that crude oil prices have gone up substantially. Yet we haven't seen huge movements higher out of the energy stocks. And usually those oil related names are leveraged uh, instruments to the price of oil itself. Uh, and, and that just hasn't played out this time around. And so uh, if those energy stocks continue to lag, it's entirely possible we'll start seeing more M&A activity as some of those bigger players out there start sniffing around and seeing where there could be some undervalued opportunities uh, where they have some uh, acreage that uh, could be viewed as, as valuable considering today's higher oil prices compared to where we were just three months ago. Remember, we're up about 17% in crude oil uh, right now on a, on a, on a three-month month basis. Let's go ahead and take a look now at our next 12 grid, and this will be our foreign stock markets 12 grid. And as these pull up here, uh, again, looking for either trends or reversals of trends or important price action. You know, one thing that did catch my eye immediately was Germany down below here, lower left-hand corner. Uh, that's EWG is one way for you to, to look at it if you're a U.S.-based investor. Of course, if you're based over in Germany, and we do have a few German listeners out there, hello to you. Uh, they're going to have a, a slightly different looking chart because it's going to be based in their home currency. Uh, but in this particular case for us as U.S.-based investors, uh, that is a, a nice looking chart right there where 
where you might have expected EWG to pull back a little bit stronger when it topped out after this candle right here. You can see it slipped for a little bit for about four or five days, but it didn't come in sharply. Notice over here it came in sharply, here it came in sharply, here it came in sharply. So it was kind of giving us an indication that this time around, it wasn't gonna let the bears take control of this quite as easily as it had in the past. And now all of a sudden we're, we are breaking up to three month highs on uh, Germany. So that's a, uh, a strong sign there, uh, especially again, remember, that uh, you know we uh, uh, we have currency movements all over uh, the map and uh, and you have to keep your your eye on you know whether the dollar's up or down on any given day but this has done a pretty good job going higher for the last three months despite that U.S. dollar strength so keep your eye on Germany there might be something uh, humming or humming right along right there for the most part these charts look decent. Um, we do have India and China that are trading below their moving averages right now. Even notice that India's uh, chart uh, moving average did turn red there. And remember that turns red when the moving average itself starts going down and price is below it. So we don't have that with China yet, but we're, we are at, at risk of seeing that occur at any given moment. Uh, but uh, right now, India is showing that. And notice that India, after having this huge surge in March, has really just gone sideways for the last, let's call it, uh, month and a half or so, and uh, and and, and it is kind of um, giving the impression that it doesn't want to resume its uptrend. So we'll keep our eye on those as some of our laggards right now. But again, Germany very impressive at this current juncture. All right, let's take a look now at the U.S. sectors 12 grid. And for those of you that are premium market scholars, if you want to follow along with your own charting package at home, this is chart 4G. Now, on this particular chart, we're looking at the S&P 500 in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and then all of the remaining 11 charts after it are the 11 different sectors of the market itself. Now, you'll notice that materials and energy are the only two with pink charts. And... What that signifies is that according to the market forecast intermediate term line, those would be considered bearish posture from an intermediate perspective right now. Uh, remember, if you right click on the charts and go to maximize sell, you can actually see the market uh, forecast down below here. And you'll notice that green line is now tilted lower. So that's why uh, XLB uh, is now considered uh, bearish. However, I thought that was a pretty strong uh, bounce out of XLB here. Uh, and so if they can get a couple of more days of rally there, I have a feeling they might be able to turn that uh, green line around. And then again, energy is not looking so hot. Now, part of this is, you know, what's going on in that uh, tug of war that I mentioned before with uh, Occidental and, and Chevron being a couple of the bigger players there. Uh, but, you know, again, it's been a bit of a disappointment to see that uh, energy really hasn't gone up substantially. Here you'll see that XLE is only up 4.32% over the last three months. Remember what I mentioned just a moment ago, crude oil prices are up 17% over that exact same time period. So energy stocks are lagging the price of oil dramatically at this point. Um, something's got to give. Either oil prices will likely come down or energy stocks will go up. Uh, right now, it's not looking so hot for the energy stocks. Uh, and so that perhaps that means that, that oil prices need to come back down or perhaps they're telling us a different story. Perhaps oil companies are going to become less profitable in the future for whatever reason. But, um, you know, the, 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 the fact remains that the chart doesn't look all that robust. And so if you are looking for more bearish trade setups out there, perhaps the energy patch uh, could get you done. Uh, now, notice that most of the other charts looking pretty strong. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily get too excited about healthcare because of that huge breakdown in the chart earlier, uh, but it certainly has recovered nicely after giving us that oversold uh, cluster signal right there. Um, I do wanna kinda spend a moment here over on the internet to kinda show you the sector selector as well. And let me see if I can pull that up here. There we go. Uh, remember, I, put, I produce this sector selector typically on Fridays. Now with this week, me being out of the office, um, being back in Omaha, I won't be able to produce the sector selector this upcoming weekend. But traditionally, I uh, produce it on Friday nights or Friday afternoon after the market closes. And so uh, this is fresh as of Friday's uh, information. Now remember, it, it consists of two different parts, an upper half that shows you uh, the uh, kind of sector rotation based off of 10 different metrics that I'm ranking these by. Uh, 
uh, and then down below those 10 different metrics themselves, and then all the stocks that kind of fit those categories. Now that is typically only available for those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars, whereas I typically do share the, at least the upper half uh, with the general population. There wasn't a whole lot of change to be aware of on a week over week basis. You'll notice that our top three sectors remain the top three sectors week over week. So not a whole lot of activity there. Where we did see activity was kind of in the middle of the groupings here. And the one specifically that I wanted to point out today because it'll affect our mindset uh, with the uh, trade application example is the consumer staples. They've really been impressing me. Notice that the consumer staples, which is kind of uh, listed here in this kind of silver ball area, uh, notice that on April 5th, the consumer staples were ranked eighth and they've gone all the way up to the number fifth ranking here uh, in just one month's time. So consistently week after week going higher. Now, when we look at uh, the charts back here, that kind of uh, should make sense. Some of you might have caught that when we were looking at them a moment ago. Notice that consumer staples have really started breaking out. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of impressive rallies here out of the staples, whether it's um, Procter & Gamble or Kimberly Clark or uh, Colgate, uh, Diageo, uh, Hershey's, Pepsi. There, there's a whole bunch of them that are legendary dividend growth types of companies as well, I might add. But, you know, this is a really strong chart considering, you know, some of these other defensive areas really haven't done much, right? Healthcare has been breaking down. Utilities and real estate have largely been going sideways, whereas the consumer staples have done a really nice job carving out a series of higher highs uh, and higher lows. So again, that's kind of the main takeaway from the sector selector there is the strength in consumer staples. We did see strength in the financial as well. And then notice that the materials uh, have kind of done the exact opposite of the staples. Notice that the materials were ranked fifth uh, here on April 5th uh, and have gone down every single week down to eighth. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, staples and materials have exactly flip-flopped one another over the last month where we are seeing an improvement uh, in the staples and a, uh, a deterioration there uh, in the materials area. So uh, anyway, just be aware of some of those movements there. And while I'm over here on the internet, just a reminder that uh, we would encourage you to click like and retweet on Twitter if you get value out of these videos. It looks like we got 74 of you to uh, do that for me last time around. So I thank those 74 of you. I'd, I'd sure like to get at least 100 of you doing that on a daily basis. Remember that David and I have to carve out a minimum of two hours every day to do these free videos for you. So uh, we, we plead with you, if you get value out of these videos, please take the five seconds and the free click on Twitter to let us know that you want us to continue doing them. Uh, also, thank you to those of you that uh, uh, kind of engage with us there on Facebook. Uh, also, a quick reminder of what some of the things we've been covering in our premium classes lately. Uh, I did teach my dividend growth investing class today where we covered the industrial space. So for those of you that are premium members, check out that recording. It is now posted in our events calendar up here at the top. Uh, and then David taught his... Uh, directional option strategies class uh, here today as well, talking about some different earnings movers and, and whatnot. Tomorrow, uh, we do have David's options inventory uh, trading class happening at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And then my strategy lab swing trading class uh, will be uh, held at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and a quick heads up that we were filled uh, and locked in our profits on Abercrombie and Fitch on, our, on one of our most recent trades there for those of you that attend that particular class. So uh, we are out of that trade as of this morning as well. All right, let's now get back on over to our charts and let's talk about our trade application example for this uh, video here tonight. And I did wanna focus on that consumer staples area that is improving. And I wanna use chart 3A for this. And this is our dividend stair step chart for those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars. And I wanted to bring up ticker symbol MO. Now this is uh, Altria Group, obviously can be a bit of a controversial name at times, depending upon your stance of trading tobacco-oriented companies. Uh, but uh, as a reminder, I'd like to, to share that with my dividend uh, uh, folks in my classes that uh, if you do choose to invest in Philip Morris or Altria or any other tobacco company, remember, you're not sending your money to them. 
you're sending your money to the people who are selling their shares to you. So uh, sometimes people uh, incorrectly think they're supporting the company if they're buying the stock. Technically, they're not. They're, they're buying aftermarket shares. Now, if you're buying it in the IPO, that's a different story. Nonetheless, uh, <laughs> some of you will just choose not to, to invest in tobacco companies, and that's completely fine. Everybody is free to uh, invest how they feel uh, best about their, their situation, and that makes sense. But uh, what I will say is that for those of you that are interested in tobacco companies or are comfortable with the idea, um, MO is a company that is close to an area that we would find attractive in my dividend growth investing classes. You'll notice that I've got this orange dividend stair step chart on our uh, chart here in front of us. This is a 10-year weekly candle chart that we're looking at. And that orange line there represents the average high yield that we use in my uh, Tuesday dividend growth investing trading rooms. And what that is, it's an average over the last decade of some of the highest yields that investors have been able to lock down for this specific company. So every chart that you would look at would have a different area where that, that orange line would be. But in the case of Altria, typically, if you're able to buy that company with a 6.04% yield or better, that is typically a good long-term entry. And you can kind of see how that's played out in the past. For instance, back here, it was touching that orange line and that would have been an attractive place to be buying MO. So MO had done quite well for the last, let's call it five years, up until topping out right here uh, in July of 2017. Now for the last couple of years, it's spent its time largely going lower. So we went from an area of being largely overvalued, notice how far away the price action was from this orange line at that time period. As a dividend investor, we would not have been buying it up here. However, now that the stock has pulled back, its dividend yield has grown to a level that is nearly 6%. Right now it's at 5.89%. Some of you that caught the news, and I think I even tweeted about it as well today, uh, Altria and Philip Morris have been kind of jointly developing uh, this product called IQOS, uh, which is a heat not burn uh, product. So uh, they've been waiting for FDA approval for a long time on this product. And today the FDA finally uh, approved that. So uh, they are hoping that will represent one of the next growth levers of their business. Uh, and I, for one, I'm not a smoker myself, but uh, I, I, for one, would support it for those of you that do smoke uh, because uh, obviously a heat not burn uh, type of a, a stick or a, a system uh, would reduce secondhand smoke that's out there. So uh, anyway, I, 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 for one, am happy that that uh, has been approved and we'll see if that becomes a new growth driver for their business or not. But because the price is a little bit above that orange line right now, we're not quite to it, right? If you would have looked at it last week, you could have purchased it at that level but now the stock has bounced notice it was up about 1.53 percent today so we're just a hair above that orange line so a lot of times when we're in a situation like this i like to sell a put at a strike price that happens to be lower than that orange dividend stair step line and that way if the stock does eventually fall a little bit more then i can at least be kind of um, satisfied that I'm applying my guidelines to looking to add to positions or buy new positions when they are attractive on a historical yield basis. Right now, we're just shy of that, but if the stock were to pull back a little bit, we would be there. So let's go on over here to the trade tab and let's pull up ticker symbol MO. And I'm gonna go out here to the June contracts with 52 days left until expiration. Now, typically I'm gonna look for an ROR or a return on risk on uh, of uh, at least uh, 1%. And so you can see that that leads us to this strike price down below here. This is actually the $50 strike price. So for those of you that are newer to the idea of selling a put and, and kind of understanding what that means, it's basically saying that you would be willing to buy 100 shares of Altria at $50 per share. Right now it's trading at $54.33. Now, in return for your willingness and your commitment to buy 100 shares at $50 per share, you are going to receive a credit up front known as the premium here. Technically, you're off. You're taking on somebody else's risk. Somebody else is buying the put that you would be selling. Sometimes it's the market maker. Sometimes it's your fellow investor or trader. But nonetheless, you then would have an obligation uh, 
to buy the stock at 50. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind because if you wake up a month or a couple months from now and the stock is trading at $40, you still have to buy it at 50 bucks. Um, so a couple things can happen. Either you know you you sell this and, and you receive your, let's call it $65. That was the last traded price, 65. So you'd receive $65 uh, in your account for your willingness to buy MO at $50 per share in 52 days for the June monthly contracts. If MO's price does go down and closes below 50 on expiration day in 52 days, then you would be forced to buy that stock at $50. If that does not happen, let's say this $54 stock turns into a $56 stock. Well, in that case, you wouldn't be forced to buy the stock at a lower price, but you would still get to keep the $65 in premium that you received up front. So that's kind of the appeal of this situation. It is a trade that does make money off of time decay. So even if MO stock price goes exactly flat, you're gonna keep your $65 that you're receiving in premium up front. So uh, if you have the proper mindset where you're willing to buy it at $50 anyway, uh, then this is a way for you to uh, kind of receive a little bit of upfront credit for your willingness to do that. So let's go ahead and place that trade. I'm going to click on the bid price here and uh, I'll just leave it in there at 61 cents here. I'm fine with that particular price. I'm just going to do one contract to show you from an application example here today. Click on confirm and send and send that off. All right, well, in closing, a reminder that we did have yet another all-time high on the S&P 500 as we head into May. Uh, remember that seasonally speaking, May is typically a little bit of a rougher month on occasion. Uh, so be on the lookout for any potential hiccups or you know cracks in the sidewalk along the way. Uh, right now, we continue to be with a path of least resistance to the upside. Uh, but as conditions change, David and I will be here to let you know. Now, if you got value out of tonight's video, make sure you go over to Twitter. Twitter, click like, click retweet, and engage with us on social media. We certainly appreciate that. David will be back with you tomorrow. Best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.